Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, welcome everybody to the Biognosis webinar, Spectronaut Pulsar, an introduction into a new era in discovery proteomics. <clears throat> My name is uh, Stefan von Sinfeld, and with me today I have uh, Lukas Reiter, who is the uh, chief, uh, the chief techno uh, technology officer of Biognosis. Uh, and today in the webinar we will cover uh, a very brief introduction of Biognosis before I give the floor to Lucas, uh, who will then speak about the uh, next ge generation proteomics and uh, Spectronaut Pulsar, um, followed by a Q&A session where we can cover all your questions about uh, the new workflows, the new software, or any other questions you may have about Biognosis workflows. So very briefly, Biognosis at a glance. Um, Biognosis is a spin-off from the ETH Zurich, from the Rudy Ebersold lab, and we were founded in 2018. Um, we develop cutting-edge methodologies for next-generation discovery and targeted proteomics. The uh, mission of the company is to bring this next-generation uh, proteomics to the market, and we do so in two ways. On the one hand, we provide uh, contract research services, so people pay us to do proteomics projects for them. But we also make available the tools we use ourselves in our contract research as products. So the reagents, the calibration peptides, the reference peptides, the bioinformatics solutions that we use in-house are also available as products and can be implemented in your proteomics lab. Uh, we also have extensive customer support to make sure that this goes smoothly. At the core of Biognosis is our R&D. We invest heavily into the research and development of new workflows uh, in proteomics, and we um, then uh, disseminate these workflows into our contract research area, but also into the products. And our ambition here is to not just deliver individual products, but really go for integrated workflows. So you'll find that our products are um, integrated and offer turnkey solutions. With this, I'd like to give the floor to um, Lucas Ryder, who will take you through the rest of the presentation. So, welcome everybody. This is uh, Lucas Ryder speaking. Um, I want to start off with a very quick introduction into uh, the different methods that can be used to acquire proteomics data when, when uh, discovery proteomics is performed. I have, have shown this slide many times. Uh, on the left, you can see a typical shotgun or data-dependent acquisition method. It's just a dummy method in this case, but you can see the typical structure of these kind of methods. So you would, the instrument would perform an MS1 survey scan and followed on this survey scan, there is a number of data-dependent MS2 scans. And the data dependency here is shown with these orange, orange arrows here. And uh, the red boxes would then be the data-dependent MS2 scans that the instrument performs and decides on the fly which precursors should be fragmented. On the right, you can see a typical uh, DIA method as it is used as biognosis. We call this uh, HRM, hyper reaction monitoring. And you can see the structure again with a dummy method. So uh, in this case, the instrument would perform again an MS1 service scan. But then instead of having a data dependent on the fly process, a number of pre-programmed MS2 scans are performed and they cover a complete, uh, the complete range that is also covered by the MS1 scan. And uh, this cycles uh, on and on in a, on a regular basis um, throughout the whole measurement process. Um, now on the, on the left, you can see because there is this data dependency, this is a somewhat semi-stochastic process because the instrument has to decide on the fly which precursors to fragment that's an no, uh, absolutely non-trivial task for the instrument to perform. Whereas on the right, you can see that you have somewhat complete acquisition. So in the full range that your method covers, you have a complete picture on the MS1 and the MS2 level uh, of the data. Um, so now um, I have to quickly wait until the, the, um, the screen flips over. Um, yeah. Yeah, so here it is. So there are 
two main uh, ways how this data can be analyzed or how the DI data can be analyzed that I would like to introduce to you. And these two major um, methods are uh, so-called peptide-centric way of analyzing the data and also a spectrum-centric way of analyzing data. So I will quickly go to the peptide-centric workflow first. This has been the workflow that has, uh, on, a, so on a time axis, has been introduced second, but is the workflow that we have mainly used over the past years. So this is um, it's actually a very simple process. So in, for this analysis, we need so-called spectral libraries. They contain ion annotations of peptides that are expected in the samples that are being analyzed. And these spectral libraries are then used to generate uh, extracted ion currents in the data on the MS1 as well as on the MS2 level. And this is done in a targeted fashion. So this is also why it's called a targeted way of analyzing the DIA data. The whole process is depicted on the right. <clears throat> um, you can look at the data in, on, from different angles. Uh, you can look at the spectrum, um, a typical spectra, or you can also look at it like normally MRM data is displayed with the time dimension on the x-axis. The second way how the data can be analyzed is the so-called spectrum-centric way of analyzing the data. And I have just uh, highlighted a few publications over the recent years that have followed this route of analyzing the data. So the special thing here is that the MS2 spectra of the DI data are uh, pre-processed, which makes them and makes the spectra then amenable to, to standard search engines. So the search engines can then search this uh, pre-processed data. And the only thing you need as input is a FASTA file or a file of protein sequences to, to search, search the data. <clears throat> and this is also depicted um, on the right. So here you can see that, uh, for instance, two, uh, two peptide precursors were fragmented in the same precursor selection window. So it gives, uh, gives rise to a mixed MS2 spectrum, but these adaptive processes can still process the data um, despite the, the complexity in the MS2 spectrum. So I will again try to switch the, the slide. Um, takes a little time. Yeah, so here it is. So this is just um, a, an overview of selected publications over the recent years to, to show you the development in the DIA field over the, over the recent years. And um, uh, it starts off around 2000, where for the first time the principle of multiplex peptide acquisition has been published. Um, then it goes on to the publication in 2003 that I want to highlight because in there for the first time uh, it was conceptually mentioned that the time dimension could be used to reduce the complexity in the MS2 spectra based on the collusion on the MS1 and MS2 level. Then in 2004 the term data independent acquisition was born. Um, then in 2000, around 2006 for the first time a DIA workflow was commercialized by Waters. And then there was a time where um, there was somewhat steady state in the development or not that much was happening. And then in two, 2012, the publication from, from the Episode Laboratory came out where they described the targeted analysis of DIA data, which um, resulted in somewhat of a boost in the, in the development in the DIA world. Shortly after, uh, normal acquisition types were published in 2013. Um, uh, Ionidility separation was included. And in 2015, for the first time, there was a really thorough publication on how DIA data can be analyzed in a spectrum-centric um, way. And this was uh, in the Alexei and the Switsky lab. And then in 2015, we published a paper where we could show that uh, DIA data produces very, very reproducible quantitation with very, very few missing values. And in 2016, uh, comparison between software packages has shown that this is a very robust and reproducible workflow. Um, so again, I have to quickly wait for the slide change. Here it is. 
So for this reason, we we uh, developed our software, Spectronaut, uh, to be able to analyze this DIA data. So Spectronaut is a fully uh, um, ad-diagnosed developed software. It is Its hallmarks are that it's very quick to set up and very easy to use. And what is also very important in our opinion is that it is daily stress test tested in our own contract research. So as Stefan has shown in the beginning, uh, Biognosis performs uh, its own contract research and consulting for, for proteomics experiments. And we use our software in this contract research ourselves. So it's um, a very good test on our software to be able to be used in a daily, in daily work. So um, we have, a, and so because we use it ourselves and because we use it on rather large experiments, Spectrum shows excellent scalability with the number of runs, also with the size of the experiments. And it also shows excellent scalability with the spectral library size. Uh, it covers the full workflow from identification to quantification to normalization, interference correction, and also to the, and then finally to the statistical testing. Um, then um, I would like to show you how this workflow evolved at Biognosis, so in our own contract research and also before that. So around, so and the bar plot in, in the middle shows you the number of precode identifications we get on a HeLa uh, cell digest in a two-hour analysis. This is done on different instrument platforms and there has been a lot of development besides the software, but this still shows you the develop, development of this workflow in our laboratory from 2011 to, to, to now, basically. Uh, it started off 2011, then we went to Bremen and acquired some DIA data on the QExactive platform. And this is also the, roughly the time point when we start developing Spectronaut. Then around 2013, we had Spectronaut 3, which was the first public release of Spectronaut. And back then we had support for Thermo and Cyx. In 2015, we had the Spectronaut 7 release, uh, we introduced extensive calibration, high precision IRT, which boosted the analysis, as you can see. And uh, in 2016, with Spectronaut 9, we added a new mass spec vendor. We added support for Bruker. Also, we improved dramatically the scalability to thousands of runs. As we saw roughly back then, that DA is very, very suited to having short gradients and having a high throughput in terms of the sample numbers. In 2017, then we had another milestone. It was for the first time that we could, we could identify and quantify more precursors than normally can be sequentially acquired with DDA on a, on a standard platform. And also we added another mass spec vendor. We added Waters and, and its sonar as an additional workflow to, to SpecNot. Now, in our daily business, in our contract research, the challenge is often to, to identify more proteins or quantify more proteins in more, so, more samples and to have better quality in quantification. So this is what our customers ask us for and somewhat implicit, what is not shown here on, or what is only shown indirectly, is that they want all this for a, a very low price or as low price as possible. Now, how can you achieve that or how can DA help you with, with achieving that? And as on the next slide, I have just described um, um, anecdotally how, how, this, um, how this works or how this, can, how this can work. So in terms of the sensitivity or the number of proteins that can be quantified, uh, there is a complete, we have a complete picture on MS1 and MS2 level in the data. And this obviously helps us to, to identify as many proteins as possible. Also, what I have mentioned before is that DA is a parallel instead of a sequential process, meaning that peptides are fragmented together instead of fragmenting one peptide after another. So there is no limit in terms of the sequential process. This means um, DA in principle and also in practice can achieve excellent sensitivity and excellent coverage of the proteome. In terms of the throughputs or the number of samples that can be measured, we, we perform almost all our experiments uh, as so-called single shot experiments. It means for the quantification part, we acquire one shot per sample or one run per sample. And it is also possible to have very short gradients because DIA, as, as mentioned before, is not limited because it's not a sequential process. 
It can have very short gradients and still very good coverage, which, which yields a very high throughput in terms of the number of samples. For the data quality, again, we have a complete picture on MS1 and MS2, which means that there is very little gaps in the data and very little resulting missing values. And for the quantification, we can choose whether we want to have quantification on MS1 or MS2 level. We can simply take what is best uh, because there is, again, there is a complete picture. Um, a small detail, but still important. Peak boundary determination can also be based on MS1 and MS2 information, with, and they are very orthogonal, of course. And because you have uh, these two orthogonal uh, information pieces, peak boundary det determination tends to be a little bit more accurate uh, because you have these two uh, lines of evidence available. So this makes the quantification better. It makes the precision of quantitation better. Now I have a few slides with uh, highlighting these, these three points. So here you can see a single liver tissue sample analyzed with CDA and HRN, and we simply compared the, date, uh, the number of data points and also the sensitivity between the two methods uh, in these single shot acquisitions. And the take home message here was that in, the, that in these liver tissue digests, we could quantify roughly twice the number of peptides. Uh, so this is on peptide precursor level and we could get roughly one order of magnitude more sensitive. Uh, for the throughput, I have this slide here, what we have also preliminary presented at the ASMS this year. So we had, we had um, access to a, a number of 1,500 samples that were very interesting from the Diogenes Consortium. And these are correspond to plasma samples that have been taken in four clinical investigation days. So the first time point corresponds to the baseline. And after eight weeks of weight uh, loss, again, some plasma samples were drawn from these roughly uh, a little less than 500 uh, individuals. And after six months uh, weight maintenance, again, a plasma sample was drawn. And then finally, for a, sub, um, um, for a subpopulation of these individuals, after one year uh, weight maintenance, again, um, a plasma sample was drawn. And Below, you can see the technical setup we used to measure these 1,546 samples. So we acquired these using 40-minute gradients, so rather short gradients, uh, in capillary flow, meaning that we had a very robust LC setup uh, using a Walters XT uh, UPLC end class uh, connected to a fusion LUMOS. And in a prelim preliminary data analysis, we performed using SpectraNOT. Um, we process the data in one go in the SpectraNOT software. So this also refers to the scalability of the software in terms of experiment size. Um, we analyze the data with a peptide and protein FDR of 1%. And using these criteria, we could quantify roughly 500 proteins in, um, in every individual run. Um, we also had QC samples regularly interspersed on these 96 well plates. And uh, the median series for these QC samples spread all over the whole experiment. They were 15% uh, in, in terms of median series. So we are very satisfied with this quantitative performance of the preliminary analysis. And we will now continue to, to analyze the data in more depth. But this shows that basically with DIA, a very high sample throughput can be achieved. In terms of the reproducibility, I have uh, two slides for you. So in this case, um, it's focused on the quantitative precision. Um, what you can see here is rep uh, repeated injections, again, of these liver tissue digest and a comparison between DDA and TIA. You can see that the precision of quantitation is um, higher for the, for the TIA method of the HRM workflow independent of the intensity of these peptides. So as a, as a result, the uh, DIA shows lower variance or lower CV across replicate injections. Um, similar in terms of data quality, um, DIA also, also shows excellent data completeness, which can be seen uh, on, in this example here, 24 repeat injections. Um, the, there are almost no uh, missing values in the atrium case, 
risk of cause a few missing values or a lot of missing values in the shotgun case. So because shotgun is a semi-stochastic process, it leads to incomplete data, which can also which can only be partially revealed using MS1 alignment processes. And HRM provides a complete picture on MS1 and MS2, that's why it results in few missing values. So there, so I have shown you now basically data that was always analyzed using spectral libraries in a targeted fashion. So there is a there is a but here because we needed to generate spectral libraries for all of what I have shown before, and this causes um, question or it it leads to questions. People often ask us, should I generate a project specific spectral library or should I use a resource library? At Biognosis, we typically use project specific libraries in our contract research, but yeah, you can see here that all of these questions uh, render the workflow somewhat complicated. And it's not um, and it's not absolutely clear what is the best way of analyzing data or how to create a spectral library. Um, so of course it would be great if either a spectral library could be generated simpler, or if it wouldn't be if it wouldn't be necessary at all. And so that's why we developed our own search engine called Pulsar at Biognosis. And so in the development, this search engine was inspired by Max Quantum DIA umpire mainly. And it's very, in, very tightly integrated into the SpectraNode Pulsar release that we had um, at the ASMS this year. Um, Pulsar is a very scalable search engine, meaning it scales well with the search space size, or in other words, the protein sequences that are being searched as well as the number of variable modifications that are used in the search. It also scales very well with the number of runs that are being searched. <clears throat> and to be able to analyze large data sets, Pulsar is also a very fast search engine. It is also a very versatile search engine, meaning it can search DIA data, DDA data, and also PRM data if there is MS1 information. And you have all the flexibility that you are used to from other search engines how to set up the in silico digest of your protein sequences database. Pulsar is MS vendor neutral, meaning it can already now search thermosaics and PUCO data, and it's relatively trivial to add other vendors as well. Uh, Spectral uh, Pulsar controls the FDR on PSM and also that protein level, which is very important with these very large data sets that can be generated nowadays. So, Combining all of those features above, um, Pulsar makes spectral library generation even simpler because it's integrated into SpectraNot and because it's a fast and scalable uh, search engine and because Pulsar can search DIA data directly, uh, it, it renders the spectral library generation completely non-necessary if it is chosen, chosen to search the DIA data directly. So this means the DIA data can be analyzed simply with a faster file or a, a file of protein sequences. And uh, you may ask what is special about Pulsar? Uh, so we implemented a dynamic PSM stratification into Pulsar, which means that we can satisfy the FDR cutoff that the user chooses, which is typically 1%, also for subsets at the PSM level, so for instance, for modified peptides. Um, it is tightly connected to spectral library generation, meaning Pulsar can very, very efficiently generate spectral libraries from large data sets. These can be thousands of LCM SMS runs, as well as um, from different types of data, so from DDA data or DIA data, as well as from combined data sets of DDA and DIA data. And Pulsar can also search many features per MS2 scan is somewhat necessary because um, we want to be able to analyze DIA data. This means Pulsar also has a very powerful uh, feature detection implemented that works on the MS1 level. Um, as I've mentioned before, Pulsar is integrated in Spectrum out Pulsar, which was released at the ASMS this year. Um, here you can see the pipeline that Pulsar works um, on if it analyzes the data set. So it would first go to the first raw file, would create the search space, process the raw file, perform calibration searches. So Pulsar has a complete 
um, pre-process where masses are being calibrated and then the main search is performed and then it will go through the raw files it will only create the search space once if it's the same search space for all the raw files and finally it will perform all the necessary tasks for data filtering such as PSMF, DR, the XRC construction for the apex retention time of the peptides, protein inference, protein FDR, the IRT calibration, which is necessary for the spectral library generation in the end. <clears throat> we, we made a quick comparison to, to MaxCon on one of our standard data sets, which corresponds to the same data I've shown before, these 24 rounds of a HEC-293 uh, human cell line digest acquired on a Q-executive. And we compared the results in terms of the strip sequences, which was almost ident identical to the MaxCon results. Um, and also in terms of the execution time, which was roughly two and a half times faster as compared to MaxCon in this case here. So because MaxCon is our gold standard database search engine, we were very satisfied with those results. And now, so this, with the release of SpecNode Pulsar, it's really a new era of discovery proteomics for us because we have now a whole number of new workflows available that we can use and that we can test. So one of the workflows certainly to highlight is what we call the direct DIA workflow. It's the most simple workflow and it, allow, it allows you to analyze DIA data without the spectral library. But there are also other workflows, as I have mentioned before. The spectral library can be generated, for instance, on a mixed data set of DDA and DIA data, and it can be all sorts of mixtures you can think of, basically. Uh, besides those main new features in Spectral Nodes Pulsar, what is, what is new in, a, in the release we had at the ASMS? So we have included protein FDR estimation in Spectral Nodes. This was very important because with the, with the large spectral libraries that, that can be generated nowadays, um, it became important to also control the protein FDR on the DIA analysis side and not only while generating the Spectral Library. We also included uh, gene ontology enrichment analysis into the post-analysis perspective of SpectraNode, and we support the Sonar now, which now, which is great. So we have added another MassSpec vendor, um, and Sonar is certainly a very interesting way of acquiring the data. And we also added Spectral Library generation from MassCode for people who are used to using MassCode, and um, this is now also supported. <coughs> Um, at the ASMS, we released SpectraNode Pulsar and SpectraNode 11 in parallel. SpectraNode 11 is the software that is available to select the academic researchers if they fulfill certain criteria, which you can find on our webpage. And here you can see an overview of the supported features by the two different software packages. So the main difference, obviously, is that Pulsar is only integrated in SpectraNode Pulsar. And now I want to say a few words about direct DIA workflow. So again, so this means you can search your DIA data simply based on a faster file and the typical settings you are used from search engines, such as variable modifications and so forth. And the pros are, um, of course, that it's a very simple and straightforward quantitative workflow. There is no need to generate a spectral library. Does this means there is also no need for additional mass spec time to generate spectral libraries. Um, it also means that you can search special modifications ad hoc. Um, you have the same flexibility as you are used to from searching uh, DDA data or from shotgun workflow. On the con side, um, the maximal depth reached is lower as compared to the analysis with a very, very deep and optimized spectral library. Um, also, the computation time is somewhat higher to what you are used from the target analysis of DIA data. As a rough guideline, you can expect a computation time that is in the same range as the gradient length you used for, for an LCMS and S1. <clears throat> At the core of SpectraNode is still our main workflow, our HRM workflow. Um, it's similar to, to the SWOF workflow. Um, it's the workflow that, that has been published in 2012 by Shile et al. Uh, it uses a spectral library for the targeted analysis of DIA data. Uh, typically, DDA runs are used to generate a spectral library. And this is the workflow we also continuously further develop ourselves. 
beside all the other workflows. Uh, then we have a workflow that we call DFD. So this is uh, very similar to the direct DIA workflow I've shown before, but it means um, that you are performing a two-step process. So first, you are searching your DI data to generate a spectral library. And these can be any DIA data. Uh, and then in the second step, you're using this spectral library to analyze the DIA data. Um, this is very similar to HRMS. But it, there is no need for DDA data to generate a spectral library. And then there is also a combined workflow, which we call DPD, um, which is DDA uh, plus DA, library-based DIA workflow. And again, this means you can search DA data and DDA data together to generate a spectral library. And then you can use this spectral library to analyze your DIA data. And here you can, for instance, have different ways of combining data. You can, you can use DDA data from uh, resources, for instance, published data that you can find online and you can, you can combine it with your quantitative DIA runs to generate a spectral library. This is certainly a very promising workflow. And if we, uh, if we have to put all these workflows in a two-dimensional map, um, this is what is shown here. So on the lower left, you have the most simple and most straightforward workflow, the direct DIA workflow. And then on the upper right, you have the most complicated, but um, potentially also the most uh, workflow providing the highest number of protein identifications, uh, identifications which is the DPD workflow. Uh, the very important thing is that all these workflows are not mutually exclusive. So this means you do not have to acquire your data in a special way to be able to analyze it with one of those workflows. <clears throat> so in our, in our um, investigations, we have found that a single optimal DIA method will perform best for all of those types of uh, analyzing your data. So this means you don't have to decide upfront. You can basically acquire your quantitative DIA runs and you can then afterwards analyze it with any of those workflows without a major drawback. Um, and now I have also some, some example data, uh, which we, um, we acquired on a set of lung tissue samples on a Q-executive HFX, which was launched this summer at the ASMS. We analyzed the data with the two main workflows, the HRM workflow and the direct ER workflow. A uh, quick description of the samples. So it's, uh, the samples corresponded to um, tissue samples from healthy individual, uh, from healthy tissue and corresponding cancerous tissue um, from 12 individuals. Uh, we also had two cancer subtypes in there, adenocarcinoma as well as squamous cell carcinoma. And we generated an extensive, deep, uh, project-specific spectral library using high-precision IRT. The details you can see below. <clears throat> but we also analyze the data um, in a direct DI workflow as shown afterwards. The DI acquisitions were done with two hour gradients, so intermediate length of gradients and the methods uh, you can also see described below. Um, with the, the method used here, we could acquire all the quantitative data within less than three days on the QExective HFX and we uh, performed the analysis using a peptide and a protein FDR of 1% that is now available in Spectrum Lab as well in the release of this summer. And here you can see a preliminary analysis um, using the deep spectral library I have, I have shown you before. So first um, we looked at the amount of blood that was, could be found in this tissue. So you would definitely expect a decent amount of blood in lung tissue and that's also what we could find. Um, interestingly, there was a difference between healthy tissue and cancerous tissue. The difference between the two cancer subtypes was uh, relatively small. Uh, overall, we had seven orders of magnitude dynamic range in terms of protein abundance. Uh, the protein abundance is arbitrary units, basically summed peptide precursor amounts. Um, Overall, we could quantify more than 7,000 proteins in this data set, and we could quantify uh, 4,500 proteins in all 24 runs or in all 24 samples. 
we had a data completeness of more than 90% on protein level, even though these were different tissue samples from different individuals or different patients. <clears throat> then we also performed uh, some exploratory data analysis on this data set. Uh, so the first thing we did was performing a principal component analysis on these 24 samples. And we could see that on PC1, on the principal component 1, we had a, basically a complete separation between healthy tissue and cancerous tissue. Um, we would have expected uh, a difference there, but that the and um, it was very striking that there was such a, a large difference between these two sample types. Uh, on principal component two, we could see um, to a certain extent separation between the two cancer types, but this was not as, <clears throat> as clear as between healthy and cancerous tissue. Uh, this is the same visualized in a two-dimensional um, heat map. Uh, with unsupervised clustering performed on both dimensions. And again, you can see that the health tissue clearly separates from the cancerous tissue, and be, uh, that within the cancer subtypes, there is also differentiation, but it's a, bit, a little bit less clear. There's, there's quite a lot of heterogeneity within the cancer sample. Um, then I went on and also had a look at some at published literature, and I found a, li a paper from the Tensor Group. Um, they have analyzed a different set of 20 uh, lung samples, also from healthy individuals and cancer uh, tissue. It was acquired on a completely different platform, on a WOTS platform, and analyzed. And uh, what was very striking is that when I looked at the 15 proteins reported in this publication to be differentially regulated between control and lung cancer tissue with very strict cutoffs, I could confirm all of those 15 proteins between uh, control and, and cancer tissue, which I found very striking because it's a different set of samples and it's a different, completely different platform this experiment was performed. And if I then pick out a few of those proteins, for instance, caveolin 1, uh, one can see a clear difference in expression level between healthy tissue and cancer tissue. And um, for the other protein, for the half limb domain protein 2, uh, that the regulation goes in the other direction. So this is a protein that is upregulated in cancer tissue. Uh, I also performed a quick comparison between the two cancer subtypes. So there are also proteins that are differentially regulated or differentially expressed between these two cancer subtypes. Um, again, there is a very large overlap between what is already published. Um, uh, however, as a, one could see in the data that uh, because of the high variability of uh, proteins within the cancer samples, uh, it is much more challenging to find proteins that distinguish the different cancer subtypes, which is also expected. Uh, two examples are again show, shown below, always with information on MS2 and MS1 levels. Uh, just three example peptides or two example peptides shown in this case. Um, as I mentioned before, we analyzed this data set with two major workflows, the direct DI workflow, where no spectral library is needed, simply a faster file, as well as with the deep protein specific spectral library uh, I have shown before. And here you can see graphically the difference in the data. It's not such a huge difference. Uh, what is very uh, striking is that for the direct DI workflow, it seems like the somewhat a little bit higher expressed, 5,000 proteins can be quantified. But because it's the higher expressed proteins, these are quantified with uh, very, very good reproducibility and with very, very few missing uh, data points. The coverage, as mentioned before, for the analysis with the spectral library was in the range of 7,000 proteins cumulatively. So the difference between the, these two ways of analyzing the data on this data set is not extremely large. Now, finally, I also have um, screenshots from the Spectronaut Pulsar release. Um, four of the, uh, of the most important perspectives are shown. On the upper left, the prepare perspective, where you can now generate spectral libraries using the Pulsar search engine. Uh, then on the upper right, you have the review perspective, 
where you can analyze your data using the direct DR workflow now or with the standard HRAM workflow. On the lower left, all of this is united in the post-analysis perspective where you can see the, the differentially regulated candidates. And on the lower right, as always, you have the possibility to uh, generate a very extensive report of your data, um, no matter whether it's a direct DR um, experiment or an HRAM experiment, uh, no matter which spectral library was used. So in summary, um, I want to, to say that DI provides excellent sensitivity, throughput, and reproducibility to these three dimensions I have shown in, the, in one of the slides in the beginning. Um, Pulsar is diagnosis search engine. Uh, Pulsar is very scalable and versatile. And uh, direct DI is a really simple and robust workflow that should get you a very easy start into the DI world if you uh, are planning on switching or trying it out. And very importantly, one DI method suffices all the workflow, workflows, meaning that um, you don't have to choose one, one method or another method depending on the type of analysis you want to, to have. And very importantly, uh, the last slide, uh, I would also like to acknowledge the, the diagnosis team. Um, yeah, let's see whether the slide is coming up. Yeah, exactly here. So I would like to acknowledge the diagnosis team. So it's really a great atmosphere to work at. And then also very importantly, I would like to thank our um, uh, the people from Biogenes. It was really great that we could get access to those very valuable samples and very could test our, our new workflow on. So this is extremely interesting and, and it's very um, it's great um, potential to analyze plasma samples in this way. And then I would also like to say special thanks to US1 and very, um, with whom we have performed a lot of collaborations over the past years. And then I would like to thank you for your interest and your attention. And I would like to hand over to Stefan for, for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Lucas, for this fantastic presentation. And um, we are open to questions. You can type your question into the question field in the right-hand side of your webinar interface and we'll be able to read your questions out loud so that the audience can hear your question and Lucas will uh, do his best to, to answer it. We'll give everybody a moment um, to start entering their questions. Maybe while people typing this up, a question from my side, Lucas. Um, now, now there are a couple of really brand new workflows here that have drastically simplified the way you can work, but also broadened up the options how you can work. Where, where do you see this going in the future? What do you think is the next step in evolution here? Okay, I think <clears throat> that's a very good question, Stefan. I think it depends a bit on what one wants to do, of course. Um, in the foreseeable future for, for standard types of experiments in our contract research, so for instance, if in our contract research we want to perform, let's say, a tissue profiling or a human cell line profiling of, let's say, 48 samples, I don't see that we will very quickly deviate from acquiring a project-specific spectral library because um, uh, it's not such a huge overhead in such kind of setting and it provides really excellent state quality. Um, however, when one, for instance, is working on somewhat smaller uh, experiments, maybe six samples that uh, need to be quantified, then I think the direct DI workflow is very, very appealing because it's um, very simple, there is no overhead, and it's uh, not such a big difference to when having a project-specific spectral library. Um, also, in the case, in the example case I have shown with this um, cancer tissue profiling, the direct DI workflow performs really excellent. Um, um, maybe one has limited sample amounts and then um, there is not enough to generate a project specific spectral library. Also in this case, it's a very interesting workflow. And then there are of course the more um, new workflows combining DDA and DI data or even uh, resource data with DI data. So I think this is very interesting, but it has to be investigated first in which case this works well. And um, so I think there is lots, to, lots of things to explore. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I would say that's roughly summarized. Yes. 
So we have questions coming in from the audience. Uh, Birgit would like to know how does our search engine compare to other search engines and have we tested the performance of the search engine, for example, when using DDA? Yeah, so I've only shown one slide here, but of course um, we have done very extensive comparison to existing search engines. Uh, we have done mainly comparisons to MaxCon because this, uh, this is the major search engine we are using in-house. But we have also uh, compared to Protein Discover and other people, our collaborators have compared to Mascot and also other search engines. Um, so if I would have shown the complete list of different data types um, we have tested and compared, it would boil down to roughly 20 or 30 different types of data uh, varying all sorts of different experiment, uh, experimental parameters also the instrument, so we had data on the LUMOS, we had data on the edge platforms, uh, we had very high MS1 resolutions, very low MS1 resolutions, uh, iron trap data, and so on and so forth. So we tried to make it really as challenging as possible, and this is then the way how we benchmarked the, the search engine. Okay, great. Um, Jarob has a question. He would like to know whether you could elaborate on the PSM stratification method. Yeah, that's also a very good question. So what we are doing is basically we stratify the PSMs according to certain criteria. And that's not very different to what has been published in the past. For instance, uh, for PEPTA profit, uh, a stratification by the charge state of the PSM has been performed. And <clears throat> what we are doing is we are stratifying on criteria where it's uh, interesting to control the FDR uh, separately, and I've mentioned this number of modifications, for instance. So, for instance, if I would perform a photoprotonics experiment, um, often I will perform the search with variable modifications, meaning I will get, as a result, non-modified peptides as well as phosphopeptides. Uh, but then in my analysis, I might be interested mostly in the phosphorylated peptides. And when using this PSM certification now, it means that the FDR will be controlled on the set of non-modified peptides as well as on the set of modified peptides, even depending on the different number of modifications there are on the peptide. So that's, that's an advantage um, because it will give you somewhat more homogeneous results. And you, if you continue your analysis with subsets of the PSMs, FDR will still be controlled. Okay, excellent. So next question from our audience, from Emmanuel. Um, how do you remove uh, interferent ions in spectronaut when performing the XIC step for quantification? Uh, yeah, okay, well, that's a very good question. So if you are browsing our science app, you will also find the application notes dedicated to exactly this topic. But what we do is actually um, quite simple. So we, we use, uh, we basically determine a consensus consensus elution profile of a peptide, and we can do this based on information available on MS1 and MS2 level. And then we take this consensus elution profile and we look for every, uh, for every ion. This again can be a fragment ion, but it can also be an ion of the MS1 isotopic envelope. We check whether it corresponds to the consensus elution profile. And if it does, it will get, um, it will get a, a low interference score, meaning that it's a high chance of having an interference. And if it does not correspond to the consent solution profile, it will get a high interference score, meaning that it will, there's a high chance of interference. And then what we can do for quantitation is we can look across the runs for all the fragment ions or all the ions, and we can check whether there is always a high interference score. And if yes, it will be consistently excluded for, for the quantitation. So meaning that this will lower your, your position or your, you will get better precision in quantitation. Right, right. Um, another question on the uh, spectral libraries from the audience here. Uh, Mike would like to know how the DIA and DDA derived uh, project specific spectrum libraries compare. Are they complementary in terms of the peptides identified? Yeah, so also a very good question. So we have started to look into this so what we found is that when, when you are having a very, very extensive and deep project-specific spectral library, then the searching of the DIA data at some point does not add a whole lot more in terms of the proteins that can be quantified. 
And we also, uh, Tejas Gandhi also had a poster at DCRS ASMS, which you can find in the Science Hub about this topic. Uh, however, when you are not, uh, what, what is a typical case, if you are not um, putting extensive effort into making a project-specific spectral library, then searching the DIA data will add something to the library. And that's, of course, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Great. So we have um, a question from Stephanie on sample types. So she would like to know which sample types, tissues, body fluids, cells, etc., are most comprehensively profiled by direct DIA. Um, I would say there is no particular difference to other label-free workflows. Um, so there's, there's no no real difference. So. In non-depleted plasma, what I have shown, uh, we can go down to roughly 500 proteins being profiled when we acquire on very short gradients. Um, in tissue, if we acquire the data in two-hour gradients, we can go down to roughly six, 7,000 proteins. Uh, and when we use longer gradients, we can even get a little bit more. Um, in CSF, I think it's in the range of 1,000 proteins or a bit more in urine as well. Uh, so this is roughly um, the depth you can reach if you are using this single shot excision strategy, so one shot per sample. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And back to back to Pulsar. Lots of questions around Pulsar here. One from Manfred. Um, how is Pulsar extracting fragment spectra from DIA data? Can you tell us something about the algorithm used? So we use uh, published principles. So um, first of all. Uh, we are performing, performing feature detection on MS1, and we search these features one after another. And once such a feature is identified, we subtract these fragment ions from the MS2 spectrum, which gives a somewhat simplification of the spectrum. But then we are also using means to, to simplify the MS2 spectra based on the, co on the correspondence of MS1 and MS2 signals. So what has been um, basically shown already or pointed out already in 2003 in this publication from poor wine so we are we are using these principles to, to perform the pre-processing of the ms2 spectrum mm -hmm. okay great so um sean has a question about um compatibility with the sis peptide so um is the direct dia workflow compatible with sis peptide and do these affect um, the analysis time yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I must say this we didn't test ourselves yet. So Pulsar is flexible in terms of uh, the ways it can search data. It can, for instance, also search SILAC data. You can add variable modifications to Pulsar. So in principle, it should be possible to, um, to perform such an analysis using a direct DR workflow. However, it will depend a bit on how complete the identification process is. Um, and then how your quantification will be as a result of that. So in this case, it's maybe a little bit better if you are performing a TFD workflow, meaning this two-step process, you will first generate a spectral library based on searching the DI data, and then you export the spectral library, complete it if necessary, and then uh, you are performing the analysis with this spectral library. So for this workflow, I would say maybe the better choice at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So one question here on scalability. So for direct DIA, um, does the number of runs impact the identified number of identified proteins, just like, for example, match between runs in MaxCon would? A very short answer, yes. So it's, it's exactly the same principle. Great. Okay. Um, one more question from Pavel on the uh, uh, spectral libraries again. What is our recommendation for the size of spectral library? In Pavel's hands, with the Brooker Qtof, the larger the spectral library is, the lower sensitivity and the lower number of IDs uh, they get. Is this common or limited to the um, their MS system or related to the sample? What is your thought on that? So it's, it has always uh, at least two effects you can see that work in uh, opposite directions. So the larger your spectral library is, the higher potential you have to, to have a peptide in there um, which you can really detect in your DIA data. But on the other hand, the larger the spectral library is, 
there is also a higher uh, the, the multi basically your search space is getting larger which makes the data analysis more challenging again so it's these two opposite effects and it's very difficult to say in a specific case which of two these two effects is the more important one what we can see for for the work we are performing here in Schlieren is that uh, we could see a trend towards being able to use larger libraries with the data we are generating so meaning that when we perform, for instance, very large gradients or long gradients on human tissue samples, we can go now to larger and larger libraries um, and identifying more proteins. Uh, however, when you would use, for instance, a huge spectral library on a human plasma sample, that's probably not very beneficial because you can only identify non decayed plasma around 500 proteins, so it will make your analysis worse because the search space is too large. So, and as I said before, typically we, we generate project-specific libraries that are relatively deep, meaning we perform fractionation, and then uh, we have a project-specific library that is quite deep, and this works best in our hands. Okay, great. So one more question from Jarup. Um, he would like to know whether we've uh, tested direct DA in the context of uh, PTM characterization. Not yet. So we have done a little bit of uh, photoproteomics work using spectral libraries. Uh, we have not done this using the direct DR workflow. And I would think that this is probably quite challenging also. So I would be careful when, so if it's for research purposes, it can be definitely tried and it will probably also work. But it's for, if it's for a real productive experiment, uh, I would first evaluate how this works because we have never done this ourselves. So we are using direct DIA uh, at the moment for standard searches with a few variable modifications such as oxidized methionine or N-terminally acetylated proteins, um, so the usual, usual settings basically. Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. So um, last question from the audience uh, before we um, close the webinar. Um, Chao Wei would like to know if you can uh, briefly tell the, uh, us about the difference between uh, Spectronaut and Skyline. Uh, difference between Spectronaut and Skyline. So Spectronaut was from the start um, uh, developed having DA in mind. So it's really, um, we want to develop Spectronaut for the analysis of DA data. <coughs> and because in these experiments, you generate a large amount of data, and um, the automated processing of the data is in the foreground. So Spectronaut also allows you to manually change integration boundaries and manually accept or reject peak, but that's not, not in the foreground of the workload. In the foreground is really automated processing of the data, automated normalization, automated interference correction, automated statistical detection of differential abundance, such that you can get quick to a final result uh, without having to look for your data manually too long. So I would say that maybe from from overall from an overall view, the biggest difference to Skyline. Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. Um, thank you very much to the audience for your great questions. This has been a great Q and A. Um, apologies to those uh, whose questions we couldn't take in the Q and A. You can always reach us at support at biognosis.com with any questions you may have to us. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you once again for taking your time to attend the webinar. Thank you, Lucas, for this great presentation in Q&A. And I wish you all um, a great rest of the day. Yes, I would also like